Hi, this is Joe Battaglia, author of The Politically Incorrect Jesus, and you are listening to On Faith's Edge with the inimitable Joe Taylor. And I found myself falling down this tunnel, and it was getting hotter and hotter. And I entered this, like, open cavern area, and I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Uh, Joe, I had no idea how I got there, why I was there. Nothing was explained, but I was fully awake and cognizant at this point and um, just aware like we are now. And I wondered, how did I get here? Why am I here? Nothing was explained until the way back. But the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was so far beyond the ability to sustain life, I wondered, how could, how could I be alive? Thank you to the unforgettable Joe Pataglia for the introduction. Joe wrote a great book called The Politically Incorrect Jesus. And Joe and I sat down and talked about that book a few months back. You can hear that conversation at onfaithsedge.com slash 44. Again, that's onfaithsedge.com slash 44. And what an appropriate conversation for today's political environment. Again, that's onfaithsedge.com slash 44. Check it out. Well, hello. Welcome to the 78th episode of On Faith's Edge. My name is Joe Taylor, recovering atheist and your servant in Jesus Christ. This is your place to hear conversations about God and living a life of faith in Jesus Christ. Today's guest is the New York Times bestselling author, Bill Weiss. Bill has an amazing story. It's absolutely incredible. On November 23rd, 1998, Bill had an out-of-body experience, which he claims falls under the classification of a vision as described in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2. This was not a dream or a near-death experience. Bill says, The Lord in His sovereignty chose to take me to hell in my spirit body. Weiss's visit to hell lasted just 23 minutes, and he returned with vivid details etched in his memory. In August of 2004, he was approached by Charisma House to write a book about his experience, And in March 2006, 23 Minutes in Hell was published and went on to be a New York Times bestseller, taking the faith community by storm. In this fascinating conversation, we talk about what he experienced while he was in hell. How certain is he that these were not simply hallucinations, dreams, or medical conditions such as a seizure? We talk about the concept of weeping and gnashing of teeth. I ask how he responds to contemporary Christian leaders that claim there is no biblical support for a place called hell. And finally, I ask him a very important question. That is, how can a loving God send his children to burn in eternity? Bill, take us back to November 22nd, 1998. Well, first of all, I'm, I was a real estate broker uh, for 35 years at that point. My wife and I just, had just been married for one year. We went to a prayer meeting that night that we attended every Sunday night, came home like any other normal night, nothing unusual. I went to bed uh, with my wife. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning to get a glass of water, and then suddenly I was pulled out of my body, like being drawn up out of your body as I was walking through the living room. I saw my body fall onto the floor. So this was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord just happened to show me that I left my body. So that's what this was. It wasn't a near-death. And uh, in a vision, just to explain a little bit more, you can actually travel, just like Paul and John actually traveled to heaven in their spirit bodies. And so that's what happened to me. I've never had a vision before, nothing like this. I've never studied the topic of hell before. I'm just a conservative Christian and uh, a realtor going to work like the rest of us. So that's what happened. And I found myself falling down this tunnel and it was getting hotter and hotter. And I entered this like open cavern area and I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Uh, Joe, I had no idea how I got there, why I was there. Nothing was explained, but I was fully awake and cognizant at this point and um, just aware like we are now. And I wondered, how did I get here? Why am I here? Nothing was explained until the way back. But the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was so far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered, how could, how could I be alive? And um, I, I noticed I was in a prison cell, but Isaiah 24, 22 mentions prison cells and uh, Proverbs 7, 27, Job 17, 16, many scriptures about what I saw. 
uh, in this actual prison cell, but like a dungeon, filthy, stinking, smoke-filled dungeon. And I looked up and I saw these demons in the cell, uh, reptilish in appearance, uh, bumps and scales all over the one's body. They were pacing like a vicious, caged animal in the cell, and they were blaspheming and cursing God. They had an extreme hatred for God. <clears throat> and uh, I wanted to get up and run, but I noticed I had no physical strength in my body whatsoever. And because you're void, there's no strength in your body in hell. Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 explain that. and Psalms 88, 4 and other verses. And uh, anyway, so I looked up and these demons just grabbed me, one of them, picked me up, threw me into the wall. They have tremendous strength and you don't have any. Uh, I had felt like, Joe, like bones had broke, but I know a spirit doesn't have bones, but it felt like that. And I felt some of the pain, but I understood most of it was being blocked. I didn't understand them, but the Lord al allowed me to feel a small amount. He blocked most of it, but he wanted me to experience a little bit so I could relate to people. It's not metaphorical. It's mm -hmm. not a state of the mind. You're going to feel r real literal pain in hell. <clears throat> and then this other demon picked me up, dug his claws in my chest, tore the flesh open. Uh, Joe, I couldn't believe oh this gosh. was actually happening. How could... How can I be living through this? And why is this happening? And I noticed I had a bad body. Matthew ten twenty eight says, Fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And Luke 16, the rich man that Jesus talked about, he had eyes to lift. He had a tongue. He wanted to drop a water to cool his tongue. He was tormented in the flame. So you have a body, but it withstands these torments. And about this time, it went dark. I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see to describe to people what it looks like, but then he withdrew his light, so then it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. But Lamentations 3, 6 mentions darkness, and Jude 13, many other verses about darkness. And But it's not just dark, Joe. You, you literally could feel it. And Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. It just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body. And I mean, you're in absolute terror in this place. I was taken out of this prison cell. I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. And this is where I could first see people inside this pit. There were literally thousands of people. I could see the outlines of them, skeleton forms uh, inside this pit burning. You could only see through the flames. It, the light doesn't travel. This huge raging pit was about a mile across with flames raging high up into this open cavern. But the light from the flames doesn't travel in hell. It's so dark, it just like consumes the light, sucks up the light. But I could see the outlines of people and they were screaming. It was so loud and deafening. You just want to get away from the screams, but you can't. You have to endure that for all eternity. <clears throat> and people clawing, trying to get out of this this big pit, but demons are shoving them back in. And But they're at a distance from each other. They're not close up. So you don't have any conversation. You're not next to somebody to have a conversation. You're You're just isolated by yourself. Uh, in this pit and burning and there's other other areas of hell i just saw this one particular area and um i would notice along the edges there were snakes and maggots but remember jesus said where their worm dies not and he used the word maggot and isaiah 14 11 says where the maggot will be spread under thee and the worm will cover thee but it's literal they're literal maggots crawling on people it's so disgusting the odors are so foul and putrid, the demons have a disgusting odor. But remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25, and uh, the smell of uh, like burning sulfur. And if you go to Hawaii, Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you can't go past a certain point because the toxicity of the sulfur coming up, it's, it's called sulfur dioxide. It'll mm -hmm. kill you to breathe it. It's toxic. Right. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And so you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. It's, it's sickening, um, and and you're physically absolutely exhausted. You have no physical strength in your body, and you need to sleep, but you never get to go to sleep in hell. It's like here, we need sleep. Well, you don't get to sleep in hell. And, uh, Revelation 14, 10, and 11 explains they have no rest day nor night, uh, primarily no mess, rest from the torment, but no rest of any kind, because Isaiah 57, 20 says the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea is always moving, so you never get the opportunity to sleep. Uh, you're hungry. You're thirsty, like the rich man in Luke 16 wanted a drop of water, but you never get that drop. And and you would do anything for a drop of water. You are so thirsty, you just feel like any moment you're going to die of thirst, but that goes on and on forever. And, um, and, and the, 
I could just go on and on about the horror of hell, but Joe, it, if anybody could see it for five seconds, it would change their life completely. And, and it did mine. The book indicates that you spent 23 minutes in hell. Is that because right. that's how long you, it was, it was confirmed. That's how long you were out. What happened to you? I mean, yeah. what, what is it? Yeah. What was the medical condition that led to this? Uh, uh, were you, had you been sick? Did you fall? Uh, did you fall no. or what, what, what had happened? I'm totally healthy. I'm a health nut person. Um, I was, you know, I was 46 years old at the time. And um, this was just a vision. You know, there's 46 different visions in the Bible that God gave people. And in uh, Acts 2.17, it says in the last days, he'll give his old, give, uh, old men dreams and your young men shall see visions. So God is giving people dreams and visions. This was just that. And I'm not to compare myself to anybody in the Bible. I'm just saying that even today, he's giving many people dreams and visions. So it had nothing to do with a medical condition, uh, no mental problems. I've never studied hell. Like I said, I've been very conservative. I'm a real estate broker. I have a successful company. I was making a half a million dollars a year in the real estate business. Uh, I didn't need any of this. Um, I told one close (laughs) friend what had happened after this. I got to stop you there for a second, Bill. I'm sorry. I I can't get over what you just said because that, that speaks to some authenticity here. You're not a guy out trying to make a buck off of a, off of a story. You're making a half a million dollars a year. And as you said, quote, I didn't need any of this. Right. Right. And, and besides that, I had told one friend it spread from there and we got invited all over the country and we paid our own way for seven years. And we never took one penny from anybody from all any church or school we went to. We never took one cent. We paid for everything ourselves. And since then we've still been paying most of it, but now some churches will pay for at least our flights. But we did this for free for a long time. And um, because I was doing well enough in the real estate business, but and and the reason was we were invited. We never sought for any place to go. And even the book, we never asked to write it. The publisher approached us and they said, would you write this book? So it's not something I ever wanted to self-promote. Matter of fact, I didn't even want to tell my best friend this, but I did tell him and uh, he, he believed me, of course, because he knows me. And like I said, it spread from there. So all this time, 10 years now, we've been on the road full time and um, we've never sought for one place to go. We keep getting invited so it's not something, again, that we're looking to self-promote, but we're happy to go because if people – I realize the value of a soul, and God loves everybody. He doesn't want one person to go to hell, and if my explaining, pointing people to the scriptures can cause them to avoid hell, then, then it's worth any uncomfortableness I would ever feel by doing this, and that's God's purpose is for no one to go to hell, but he gives them a free will to choose. And so my wife and I go and we share what happened, but I point people to the scriptures. It's not, point, it's not important for them to believe my experience. What's important for them is to believe the word of God. But a lot of churches are not teaching the truth about hell. There's a teaching called annihilationism, which is a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus, or universalism, that everybody eventually gets saved out of hell, mm. or soul sleep, many false teachings. And so the Lord wanted me to point people to the scriptures, and that's what I'm doing. That's why I have over 250 verses in my book about everything I saw is already in the Bible, and that's what's important for people to believe. What do you say to those, Bill, that that claim that this was just a hallucination or the brain misfiring or a a seizure of some sort? Well, why would I quit my career and travel and pay my own way? And when we left our career, we both left a lot of money. And we didn't have any idea how we're going to pay for this. And, uh, but God, we used our savings and kept traveling and paying for this. So no bad dream would cause you to give up a good career that I worked at for 35 years to build up that business. And um, besides, you know, it, it's, I'm just pointing people to the scripture. It doesn't matter if they believe me. Uh, I'm not trying to convince them to believe me. So, um, but, but the Bible is full of visions. So that's, I just try to point people, Hey, I'm, I'm just one of the many that's, I had a vision before. It's just that in a vision, you can actually travel, not all visions, but some you can actually travel. Like in Ezekiel chapter eight, uh, he was picked up by his hair and carried, Ezekiel was carried from Babylon to Jerusalem in a vision. He actually traveled there. So God can have you travel in a vision if he cho- so chooses. So that's what this was. And um, I, I just, again, want people to realize how severe hell is. 
Now, we serve a loving God. He doesn't want anybody to go. That's why he died a horrific death on the cross, was to keep people out of this place. But he, because he loves man, he gives them that free will to choose. Do you believe him or don't you? Mm. And he's telling you, he's giving you a warning. Hey, there's a hell. And the reason hell is so horrible is because it's a place absent from God's attributes. All good things come from God, James 1.17 said. So people think this good is Mother Nature. No, it's from Father God that we enjoy the earth and all its blessings. Uh, Psalm 33.5 says the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. But if you deny him, there's a place prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for man. It was prepared for the devil. But if, God, if man rejects the only provision for our sin, which is Jesus Christ, then he sends himself to hell. And Jesus said, Matthew, uh, in Revelation 21, 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So he warned you, you'll have your part in the lake of fire if you don't believe the word. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you. Because people say, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe Jesus is the only way. So they send themselves to hell to the place that was prepared for the devil. So that's why it's so horrific. It's, it's a place absent from God's attributes. You bring, up a, you bring up a good point here, Bill, because... Because without choice, there is no love. Because you're, if you're forcing somebody to love you, then that's not love, of course. Right. So without choice, right. there exactly. is no love. But you have to have something to choose between. You either choose right. God or you choose something else. And in this case, what you're saying is that you're choosing you're choosing hell. After this, after this happened, did you seek any kind of medical advice just to confirm, hey, I'm uh, something crazy happened to me. I, 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 I at least need to see a counselor or to see a, a doctor just to just to see what in the world this was. No, actually, I didn't, because two things, when I came back into my body, the horrors of hell were so severe, I literally felt my body dying. And I asked my wife to pray for me, and she prayed, and God graciously removed the horror but left the memory. So we know God can divide both soul and spirit. So somehow he took out the horror part, and I immediately calmed down, and I, then I was fine. But it was only because God removed it. So I knew I was totally fine because of what God did, uh, and no medical person would understand that or be able to do anything about that part. But I was fine after that. I never had any nightmares. I never had any problems. Nothing like that. God removed it all. And to this day, I've never had any kind of nightmare or anything, or I don't have fear of hell or darkness or anything. Isn't that interesting? God graciously showed it. Isn't that interesting? Because you said that you remember that there was pain and there was agony, Mm -hmm. but you don't remember the pain and the agony. Is that right? Right, right. Basically, he took away all that horror. Uh, almost like I, I read a book about it. I mean, that kind of separation. But yet, you know, God is able to do that. And, and I, you know, anybody that would see hell, it's so severe just seeing it. You know, you've heard of people in the war that have gone through so much trauma, their hair falls out or, you know, they have all kinds of issues from just seeing the trauma. Well, that's what hell will do to you too, if without God's help. So, um, with God, then he is the one to remove all that. And so praise God, I'm fine. And we've been blessed and, and traveling all over the world. We've seen hundreds of thousands of people come to the altar at our meetings. And that's the whole point is the fruit. You know, are there people getting saved? And they are because of so much word. I quote the word and that's what's important for them to hear, not my experience. So prior to this, prior to this happening, you weren't, you, were you a pastor? Were you a minister or were you just kind of your run? Sorry for the I, expression, just your run of the mill every day. As you said, conservative Christian working his job, maybe going to church and doing his thing. I was a worship leader at our church. Okay. And I was, I also taught uh, at classes at the church on different things like wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, you know, Proverbs and ethics, character, uh, and so forth, and, and developing character and uh, ethics and business through the Word of God, applying God's principles to your life, uh, honesty and treating everybody right, and so forth. So I taught a lot on that. I never thought I would teach on hell. You know, that was not anything I'd be really interested. In. I was a Christian, glad I wasn't going there. You know, but I never really knew much. Didn't know much about it. But after that, for seven years before the book came out. 
I started studying the topic and listening to speakers from all over the world on the topic of hell so I could learn about it because I knew anything I saw, if it's true, if they were, it would be in the Bible. So I studied it for seven years, the topic after that, and then the publisher came to me and said, would you write a book on this topic? And I said, well, who, who would buy my book? I'm just a realtor. Uh, I'm not in anybody. It's not endorsed by anybody, you know? And... Uh, so anyway, but it became a New York Times bestseller, so which is only God could do that. And endorsed by you know, dozens because, and dozens of well-respected pastors and, and Christian leaders uh, across the world. Yeah, now, now. But at the beginning, when it came out, it wasn't endorsed by anybody. You mentioned learning about hell. You mentioned you, you kind of went on this, this, this knowledge quest about hell. What, what biblical concepts of hell are supported by your visit to hell? Well, all the scriptures, I mean, uh, Jesus talked about hell in 46 different verses. So, I mean, he talked about it more than anybody. Uh, you know, and so I have all those, those scriptures listed in, in my books, and, uh, and that's, that's the main thing. Then I look up all the greatest commentaries, you know, Matthew Henry and Believer's Bible and Jameson Fawcett Brown and Nelson's and uh, Baker and so forth. I, I looked up all the scriptures, and then what they say about those verses to make sure they're not taken out of context. So I quote the commentaries in my second book uh, called Hell, Separate the Truth from Fiction, more of a study guide that gives all the quotes from the commentators, all the scripture, so uh, and all the greatest leaders of the past and present from Augustine to Billy Graham, you know. So I give all that type of support with what I'm saying, and all the greatest scholars of today even that believe in hell, uh, that support it, like the book Hell Under Fire and the book Hell on Trial. They're really reputable scholarly books that uh, point out the same things I am, so by, by the guys with the PhDs and so forth. In chapter 7, titled What You Believe is Important, on page 102, Bill says, for the most part, hell is not a popular subject in churches today. Many churches do not even believe or teach that hell is a literal burning place. The pastors in these churches do not want to offend their people by telling them there is a real hell to shun. Other people are offended by a message about hell and think Christians should keep their beliefs to themselves. Bill, how do you feel about the popular view among some Christian authors that there is no hell at all. The word for hell that Jesus uh, was initially recorded to have said was Gehenna, which is the Valley of Hinnom on the south wall of Jerusalem. In fact, hell is indeed a real place. It's just where the people of Jerusalem threw and burned their trash. Well, he was just using that word because he, it gave a graphic picture of what hell looks like. He's saying, you want to know what hell looks like? I mean, Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Dictionary points this out, and Holman's, and so forth. So he was saying, you know, you want to see what hell looks like? Look at Gehenna. There's dead bodies there eaten by maggots. There's wild dogs tearing at the flesh. The stench is disgusting. There's fires burning continuously, and uh, filth and garbage in there. That's what hell looks like. That's what he was saying. So because they understood, man, that's a disgusting place. He's saying that's what hell looks like. So that's the reason he used that word. And then there's, uh, you know, he also four other places he used the word Hades, which is the current hell, or Sheol is the Hebrew word for the current hell down deep in the earth. That's present right now. Now, after Judgment Day, death and hell, or Hades, are delivered up and cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 12 through 15. But uh, he used the word um, Hades four times to describe hell. Now, Capernaum, you shall be brought down to hell. And he used the word there, uh, Hades. And, and Luke 16, he talked about the rich man in Hades, lifted up his eyes, and he looked across a great gulf fixed, because hell was separated by a gulf fixed then. And there was the Hades side, the torment side, and there was Abraham's bosom, the other side. And so the, the rich man was looking across and, and to Abraham, and he was begging him for to send Lazarus back to warn his brothers so they wouldn't have to come to this place of torment. And he said he was tormented in the flame. So it's that, and it was not a, this is not just a um, parable. As some say, well, that's just a parable. It wasn't for two reasons. Number one, no parable has a name in it. This has three names, Abraham, Moses, and Lazarus. And number two, even more importantly, in verse 25, Jesus said, and Abraham said to the rich man, 
Jesus was quoting Abraham as saying. Now, if it was a parable, Jesus would have been lying because Abraham really didn't say it. You see, so it's mm. not a parable. Mm. It's definitely a true story. And um, even if it was a parable, what did the parable mean? He's saying that the guy's in torment, and he's worried about his brothers coming to this place of torment. Either way, it's, it's clear it's a hell, uh, sufferings in this place. So Jesus made it real clear there's a hell, and I could give you all kinds of scriptures, Matthew 25, 41, Matthew 22, 13, Mark 9, 43, Luke 12, 4, and 5, Matthew 18, 8, Matthew 25, 46, John 15, 6, John 5, 29, Luke 19, 27, Matthew 18, 6. I can go on and on. There's so many verses about where Jesus talked about hell being cast into uh, everlasting fire, uh, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And, you know, uh, the, the man that was found in the, uh, without a wedding garment said, bind him hand and foot and cast him away into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said to depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And he said, he will cut him in pieces and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, he made it so clear. Uh, Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night. In now that shows you clearly they're, they're existing. They're in hell in torment. And then, like I said, Matthew, uh, in Revelation 20, 12, says death and hell, the current hell, deliver up the dead that are in them, and they're judged. So he's telling you there's people in hell now. They're going to be judged. And then it says they're cast into the lake of fire, Revelation twenty fifteen, And uh, Revelation 21, 8 talks about all liars and adulterers and so forth. They'll be cast into the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. So it's abundantly clear, but I think the reason the pastors aren't talking about it is they cannot reconcile a loving God with a God that would allow people to suffer in hell for all eternity. So they just say, hey, God's loving, and they don't look at, yes, but God's also just, and he loves justice and judgment. So and reconcile, he's he's reconcile that for us, Bill. Reconcile, because this is, you know, this is one of those big, big right. questions. Reconcile for us, in your view, a loving God that would allow— Maybe not send, because I, I do believe mm -hmm. that that there is a, a choice here that people make, but that would allow people who he says, I, I would I, I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't want anybody to right. for this. I want I want everybody to go to heaven. So reconcile a loving God with hell in the existence of this place where he would even let his children choose right. torment. I wouldn't let my child walk across the street. Right. I wouldn't let my child play with fire or touch right. the stove. I but, wouldn't let my file. I wouldn't let my child right. even ride a bicycle without a helmet, even if they want it but to, the, and they chose it. So reckon, uh, but, reconcile okay. that for us, I Bill. Can, I can do that easy. First of all, they're not his children. Galatians three twenty six, John one twelve, John eight forty four, Romans nine, seven and eight, John seventeen, nine. All explain. They're not his kids. They're not his children. They're his creation. But you don't come, become his child until you receive Jesus as your personal savior, your personal savior. So until then, they're his creation. They're not his child, number one. Number two, his love is not in question. He sent his son to die a horrible death on the cross for that purpose, to keep him out. But people say, like in Romans 1, it says they push him away. They know the way, but they say, no, I'm not interested. I don't want him as my father. I don't want him as my God. I'm not interested. So they're the ones that push him away. So he says, hey, it's your choice. You, and here's how you stay out of hell. I'm telling you how to stay out of hell. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And they say, well, you know what? I don't believe that, and I don't value your son. And now God sent the most precious thing, his own son, how many of us would send our child to die for somebody that hates you and so forth? But he did that. And then the people not only don't value it, they use his name as a curse word throughout their life. So that – and number two, God can't take someone out of hell after a time because he's loving because he's – two two reasons. Number one, if he took them out of hell after a time, that would be works. That's like saying, hey, I paid two or three hundred years off of my sin. I paid for my sin. And you cannot pay for sin because only the shed blood of Jesus can pay for sin. See, our time 
is the wrong premise. Our time is not valuable enough to pay for sin. Our time isn't valuable enough to pay for sin. See, so time is the wrong premise. And so he, and if he took us out of hell, where is he going to put us? He can't take us into heaven the way we are because our fallen nature would corrupt heaven just like we have corrupted the earth. And Revelation 21, 27 says he'll let nothing in heaven that defiles or corrupts. So he can't take us into heaven with our fallen nature. And you don't get a new nature by time spent in hell. You only get a new nature by receiving Jesus, repenting of your sin, asking God to forgive you of your sin, turning and trusting in Jesus, and believing that he died for your sins on the cross, that he paid the price. So that then God considers our trust in the cross as if we were righteous, and he gives us a new heart and a new spirit. See, that comes from a trust rather than time. So time would never work. It's a wrong premise. Mm. And so, that, so God, to prove he's loving, I mean, he, he suffered this horrible death to keep people out. What more would you want him to do? And then he gave you the free will. You choose. I'm telling you how to stay out. And, but it's your choice. So, and it's not that, you know, God's sending people to hell. We're already going there. Everybody above the age of accountability are automatically on the road to hell because we're born in sin. John three seventeen and 18 says we're condemned already because we're born in sin. Psalm 51, 2. So that's different than being sent there. We're already going there. That's why Jesus came and planted a cross right in the middle of that road that we're all on. So all we have to do is look up to the cross and it'll take us off. See, there was no way when Adam and Eve sinned, that separated man from God. Now, how's he going to get to heaven? He can't because you have to be perfect to get into heaven because God's perfect and heaven's perfect. How are we going to get in now? Well, God made a way where there was no way. He said, okay, I'll come down. I'll pay for their sin. I'll die in their place. All they have to do is trust me and believe that I'm the son of God and I'm dying for them and for them to repent, ask forgiveness for their sin. If they would do that, then I'll consider their trust as if they were righteous, and I'll give them a new heart and a new spirit. So he made a way where there was none, and that's pretty amazing. Mm. So there, there's only one way, but he made it clear how to get there. So that's how you reconcile it. And one last thing, you ha we have to realize who we're sinning against. We're sinning against the holy God, and Thomas Aquinas, he was a, considered the greatest theologian of the medieval church, and he said— the higher the position the one sinned against, the graver the sin. In other words, if I lie to you, Joe, it'd be wrong. But if I lie to the Supreme Court, it would be worse because of their position. If I punch my brother in the stomach, it'd be wrong. But if I punch my mother in the stomach, it'd be worse because of her position. Mm. Well, God is infinitely greater in position, but he's also infinitely greater in being. If I step on a bug and kill it, no big deal, even though it's life. But if I kill a dog or cat, maybe your pet, well, that would be worse. That would be de deserving of some kind of punishment, wouldn't it? Well, if I kill a human being, that would be even worse, deserving of a much greater punishment. Well, we've sinned against a holy, omnipotent, perfect, eternal God. So therefore, our sin is deserving of eternal punishment because of the one we've sinned against. And that's what man doesn't grasp. You devote 27 pages on the important facts about hell. Can we cover a few of those? Sure. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Is hell a physical place or a spiritual place? Well, I believe it's in the, it's in the physical center of the earth. Whether, it, whether we could see it in our physical eyes or not, I don't know. I doubt it. It's probably just a, it's a place. It inhabits a place, but it might only be seen spiritually. Just like uh, there's uh, gamma rays and uh, x-rays that are floating, floating through the air, radio waves. They're here, but we don't see them. But yet, if you had the right equipment, you could see a gamma ray or a X-ray. You see what I mean? So it's probably that you couldn't see it with your physical eye, but if your eye was tuned differently, just like there's angels and demons all around us, but we don't see them because our eye is not tuned to it. So you're saying but that hell a is a place. You're saying that hell is a physical place within the ba earthly bounds. Right. It's a geographical location. Wow. Correct. Okay. That's what most of the scholars think. That's what most scholars think also, not just me. But, you know, since he said it was separated by a great gulf fixed, and a gulf fixed means a great chasm. So it's like a division, like a chasm down deep in the earth that separated Abraham's bosom from the torment side of hell. And that's where the, the spirits of men would go, you know, when they die. And so it, it's a physical location, just like heaven is a physical location someplace. We just can't see it. Is there a literal fire? 
a literal burning fire? Yes, uh, even according to John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, all the greatest teachers, they believe it's literal fire also. But the, more importantly, there's there's um, so many verses on fire. There's 49 verses actually on the fires of hell, you know, and uh, Psalms 11, 6. Uh, Psalms 140, verse 10, and many verses, Matthew 13, 49, angels will sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Uh, and so there's many scriptures on fire. So I believe it's literal fire. I felt the heat. I saw the flames, but it's what the scripture says. You know, Psalms 11, 6, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. And then in Revelation, uh, in Revelation 12, uh, or 9, Revelation 9, it talks about the bottomless pit will be open. And it says there arose a great smoke out of the bottomless pit to where our air, our own air and sky were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Well, it couldn't have been a metaphorical fire to produce real smoke that darkened our own sun. See, so it's showing it's a real fire down deep in the earth. And it's describing that pit of fire that the demons were, are held in chains. So there's real fire down. I believe it's literal. What about the idea of weeping and gnashing of teeth? Well, that's, again, people screaming in agony for all eternity. Uh, they'll weep and gnash their teeth. Uh, I think gnashing is partially, uh, they'll be so angry, like in Revelation 16, it talks about uh, during the tribulation time here on the earth that men will hide themselves in caves, uh, caves and so forth to, to avoid the horror that's going on on the earth. But it says they will gnash their teeth. They'll be so angry at God uh, for all this going on. They won't repent. They'll just be angry at God. You believe what you saw, what you witnessed, were actual human beings that died and went to hell, and you witnessed what they were going through, that these were actual historical people, people from history, whoever they may mm -hmm. have been, that died yeah. and now are in hell in, in, for eternity, and you saw them. Yes, yes, I and again, I just point people to scripture, you know, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, art thou become weak as we? And um, you know, so talking about people talking and uh, talking in hell. Ezekiel 32 talks about the strong among the mighty that were upon the earth shall speak out of the midst of hell. And it describes them, uh, their graves round about themselves and they bear their shame in hell and so forth. So it's talking about people literally in hell just like Luke 16, the rich man in hell. Uh, jo Jonah 2.2, it says, in hell I cried out. So a lot of scholars believe Jonah himself, when he, and he, that he probably died in the whale's belly, and he was at the gates of Sheol, it says that. They use the word Sheol. And in, he and in hell he cried out. So there's a person that actually saw hell in the Bible and so forth. So yes, I believe it's real, literal people, just like Jesus talked about. And he said, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many go therein and narrows the gate and straight is the way that leads to eternal life in Matthew 7. So he's saying there's many people going to hell. How, and, I, mean, how, uh, that's I, why I, I can't, I can't get this image out of my head, Bill, <laughs> the idea that you actually saw somebody, a person that did not give their life to Christ mm -hmm. died and that that soul that you're looking at is was an actual person to this day. And I can tell in your the passion of your story. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you wrote this book in 1998, right? Or when did you write the book? The first or, book? Uh, uh, 2006. 2006. I'm sorry. But you experienced this in 1998. So in 1998. Correct. 1998. Correct. So for the past two decades, you still right. have this passion. And and I got to think part of that is because you saw people burning, literal people burning in hell. It just blows my mind. Right. Blows my mind, brother. Well, at, when I was there, I know, I know. It's it's hard to imagine that they're down deep in the earth right now. There are millions of people that used to live here on the earth, but now they're down there suffering for all eternity. And, you know, the Psalms 88, 12 and so forth talk about they're forgotten, right? Most people don't think about people that are in hell. I mean, there are people down there that are forgotten, and they're suffering in hell for all eternity because they rejected Jesus Christ. And it's not that they only had one chance. God gives everybody thousands of opportunities throughout their whole life to repent and receive him as their Lord and Savior. But people push him away. 
And he doesn't want to see people go to hell. He said he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't want to see one person go to hell. But he died. What else could you want him to do to keep people out? You know, and Jesus said in Luke 12, he said, don't be afraid of them that kill the body and there's no more they can do after that. Rather, fear him who is after he has killed the body has power to cast into hell. I tell you, fear him. So he's telling you there's a, something worse than death coming. Uh, same thing he says in um, Matthew 18, 6. He said, if you offend one of these little ones, it's better for you that a millstone be hanged about your neck and you be drowned in the sea. So he's telling you there's something worse than drowning in the sea that's coming if you offend one of these little ones, uh, a child, and so forth. So <clears throat> he's, he's got so many warnings that there's something worse coming if you do this, these things, reject him as your Lord and Savior, then people are going to end up in this place. And I know it's horrible to think that, you know, I wanted to rescue some of those people out of the fire. That's how I felt when I was there. But the Lord said to me afterwards, well, now you have a chance to rescue them out of the fire before they get there. Mm. For those that read the first book um, or the first edition, what's uh, what can they expect in this new updated edition? Well, we got four chapters, four different chapters in the, in the book. One is I expound on my experience. I give more scriptures and support for some of the things I saw. I expound on a couple things that I maybe didn't cover quite as clearly uh, and that I, I saw in hell. Uh, I have a, a chapter on testimonies, maybe about 50 different people, emails of people that their lives have changed, what they say, how the book has changed their life and how they've gotten saved or didn't commit suicide, uh, many serious kinds of things like that, that people, amazing stories that people write us and tell us how the, the book has really impacted their life. I give an update on our ministry and so forth. And then I answer the 10 top questions that people ask, the most difficult questions, you know, like a you know, how can a loving God send a good person to hell? And uh, is hell eternal? And uh, why is hell so horrible? I explain why it's so horrible and where it's located and, and many other questions. Uh, you know, what about the guy in the jungle that never heard the gospel? Is he going to go to hell? And I answer all those questions in the book uh, in, with, with scripture and, and analogies and detail and so forth. So a lot of added content in this book. How do you hope people are changed by this book? Well, it's, it's affected too. It affects the, the person that's not saved. We've had, like I said, hundreds of thousands come to the, to the Lord through emails, through our meetings at churches, because we fly all around the world. And uh, so that's number one, people are getting saved. Number two, Christians are waking up. And I had three things that affects them. Number one, it causes them to appreciate their salvation much more than they maybe do. Number two, it causes them to walk more in the fear of the Lord. Uh, to have an awe and a respect for Almighty God and to obey His Word. And number three, it gives them more of a passion for the lost, a desire to want to go and witness and share the gospel with the world, because God's called us all to do that. It's not just for the pastor. He's told us all to go into all the world and preach the gospel. But most Christians don't. They might go to church, and that's all good, but we're also called to share the truth, the Word of God. Not be people over the head with a Bible, not chase them down the street corner. Mainly be a good example through your life example. Are you uh, quick to show forgiveness to people that are ugly to you? Do you walk in love? Um, do you show up on time for work? Do you work with excellence? Do you be a good example, but also to share the Word of God with people because these words are eternal life. It can change someone's life for all eternity if we take the effort. So it's done those two things. We have a significant number of people who listen to the show that are not believers or, or not yet believers, right. as we might say. What would you say to that person that is right on faith's edge, deciding whether to believe in God or not believe in God? Well, you know, if you did some investigation into the Bible, you'll find out that it's, there, it's proven. There is no uh, discrepancies. Uh, there's Jesus Christ did rise from the dead. No other religion claims that. So no one other religion claims they died in your place and then rose from the dead. So Christianity is unique, and you can research it and find out every word is true. Uh, so I would encourage someone to investigate it if you're not sure. But why would you take a chance with your soul? The most precious thing you have is your soul, and Jesus has told us clearly how to stay out of hell. Why would someone risk and think, you know, I just don't believe that? and risk their own eternity 
not even research it. Most people don't. They don't research it and find out. They put more effort into a short holiday than they do in an eternity. So I'm encouraging them to check it out and trust what God said, you know, and just repent. It's just a simple thing. Just say, I'm sorry for my sins. Uh, you know, I can't save myself. I'm not perfect. You know, none of us are. But I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. And, uh, and, and besides that, God wants to help us in this life. And, and help us throughout our life. People are going through all kinds of struggles. God wants to help them. And uh, so I would encourage them to research the word, check out what it has to say, just repent, receive him as your Lord and Savior, and he'll take you off that road that we're all on before we accept him, all on going to hell. That's what I'm encouraging them to do. Jesus said again, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He said he was the only way. You want to live in his house? You do it his way. There's only one way. I don't think we can say anything more than that. Bill, thank you so much for hanging out with us tonight. The book is 23 Minutes in Hell, One Man's Story About What He Saw, Heard, and Felt in That Place of Torment, the 10th anniversary edition of this amazing New York Times bestseller. Bill, thank you so much. Thank you, Joe. It's an honor to be with you. Really appreciate it. God bless you, brother. Bill's website is soulchoiceministries.org. Again, that's soulchoiceministries.org. And the 10th anniversary edition of 23 Minutes in Hell can be found at amazon.com. Of course, these links, as well as all the other links, can be found in today's show notes at onfaithsedge.com slash 78. That's onfaithsedge.com slash 78. Well, that'll wrap up today's show. Thank you to Bill Weiss for being with us. And thank you for listening. You mean a lot to me. And you mean a lot to this show. Remember, God is real. He loves you. And so do I. God bless. Thank you for listening to On Faith's Edge. You can subscribe to the show via iTunes, Stitcher, Internet Radio, or your favorite podcast app on Android, Apple, or Windows devices. To reach out to Joe or leave comments about the show, visit onfaithsedge.com. You're important to us, and we would love to hear from you.